Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to um, this, our first session of the 2023 uh, Annual Meeting of the Religious Education Association. I'm Ann Walker, and I'm pleased this evening to welcome you to the session titled Informal Approaches to Cultural Religious Formation. Um, we have four presenters tonight presenting, uh, who, will, who will deliver three presentations. Um, and I will introduce them now, Sister Anhua Nguyen, Kayla August, Yun Il David Cho, and Gram Han. We will have um, about 15 minutes for each presenter to share their thoughts, followed by a seven minute um, period of comment on that particular paper before we move to the next. Um, at the end of the sharing of the three presentations, we should have about 20 minutes to discuss um, all three of the papers um, together, um, both the intersections of those papers and any ideas um, that you hear that you would like to tease out. So I will begin uh, by introducing our, our first presenter more fully, Sister An Hua Nguyen is a third year PhD international student in theology and education at Boston College and a perpetually professed member of the Congregation of the Lovers of the Holy Cross, the first women's religious order instituted in Vietnam in 1671. Sister An Hua will present children's moral agency in the context of Vietnamese American Catholic families. Okay, An Hua, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Let me share my PowerPoint first. Can you all see my full screen for the PowerPoint? Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you for coming today. The, the topic is about children's agency in the context of Vietnamese immigrants, uh, Vietnamese American Catholic families. I propose that acknowledging and nurturing children's agency can bring transformation to both parents and children in their faith journey, rather than seeing children as passive recipient of faith formation, uplifting children's agency seeks to empower them to build their own sense of identity. Children can also bring impact to their parents. In the context of Vietnamese American Catholic families, this can be done by implementing a just love model in faith formation, by seeing children as an image of God. Parents and those who care for children acknowledge and respect children's dignity, dignity and treat them as subjects of spiritual insight who can inspire and transform the, the whole family as well. With that in mind, I want to share the outline. There are four main things. First, uh, rereading the history of Vietnamese immigrant family. Second, children's and young people's agency. Third, the just love in family faith formation, and last questions for discussion. First, rereading the history of Vietnamese immigrant families. Uh, some of you may know that after the fall of Saigon in 1975, two million Vietnamese became refugees between 1975 and 1995. And the fact is that children were reported about 30 times more often for being discriminated against as compared to their parents. Think about that if they are children of immigrant parents. Immigrant Vietnamese children are caught between two cultures and two worlds, the East and West, their homeland and the US. Peter Fan calls it the between and between status, to be neither here nor there, to be neither this thing nor that. Fan defies the in-between status socially as being part of a minority, not fully integrated or accepted by either cultural systems. People are struggling 
a different world that checks their self-identity, sense of agency, and belonging. The second part, I will give a short overview of children's agencies. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie J. Mueller McLemo argues that we hold a distorted view of children um, and we, we also didn't see their right to be an agent fully. Uh, she also reimagines a gene by sipping to the view of children's care and rearing as a religious practice and community discipline. Uh, feminine theologians promote children's well-being as a shared responsibility among educators, families, and the community to protect them from exploitation and abuse as the subject that we choose for, for the conference this year. So caring for children is not just anyone but a shared responsibility. People do not need to be the voice of their children when they, when they take care or educate children. Why? Because they have their own voice and agency. What do we need to do? We need to create spaces to let children's voices be heard. The shift to seeing children at, as agents is based on two theological views. First, children as persons created in God's image. And second, children as a sort of spiritual insight. Therefore, children deserve full dignity, agency, and personhood before God and people. Children can make moral decisions in according to their age and understanding. I was a kindergarten teacher for 10 years. So the pictures that you see throughout the presentation today were took uh, from the school in my community in Saigon. I served before I come to this country. Uh, children can make their moral decision. Uh, another theologian, Christina Trena, asserts that the status of incomplete autonomy does not, does not remove their agency. They have a right to be active in their own welfare in the context of immigrant. So empower, empowering immigrant children's agency a crucial, is a crucial responsibility for those who accompany them in their educational training, faith practice, or psychological development. Research done in 2021 in examined the positive effects of youth program on the development of ethnic identity and youth agency in second generation Vietnamese American adolescents. Vietnamese Catholic communities perform a similar function with youth development programs that facilitate ethnic identity development for immigrant children and youth. They have space to come to find a sense of belonging, a space to share their stories. However, one thing led, that's it, their parents. We don't see their parents in the church. And children can also don't have chance to listen to their parents, the immigrants, their stories, how they get here, how they live, how they experience life. So with that in mind, I share with you the Just Love in Faith, uh, Family Faith Formation. This section proposes a model to uplift children's agency in faith formation and cause for a centering shift toward children as subjects and active agents. Why a just love in faith formation? Because uh, I want to base on children's agency to accompany immigrant families. Just love refers to both mutual and equal relationships between parents and children through rewriting a new Christian family narrative to empower children and agency. Those who come from patriarchal society know that children have lack respond, uh, responsibility, voices, or even agency uh, comparing to other family members. Immigration impacts Vietnamese American Catholic family uh, relative to how they practice faith and transmit their Vietnamese tradition. Scholar in immigrant studies emphasize that various family patterns of immigrants 
are not passively handed down from generation to generations. Instead, immigrants selectively choose and active use varied cultural resources within particular social contexts and contents. They create new family tradition. Traditional Vietnamese parents often identify as a generational sacrifice. Parents can do everything for their children. Again, for their children. I challenge here about how about parents do everything with their children? This is challenging for Vietnamese parents when they are so busy. This attitude may harm both children and parents because it reflects one way of love from parents to children and perpetuates a model that sees children as passive recipient. Another harmful narrative is seeing children as an economic burden for families. As you know, if immigrants came to a new country, economic resources, are not available for them. They need to make it happen and try out their best. So having a child often impacts a mother negatively. She might lose her job or miss opportunities for promotion. Some mothers choose to stay home to offer care for the child as a motherly sacrifice again. The narrative are good, but might reflect mutual love, but unequal relationships. Again, the uh, Mueller McLemo suggests keeping a balance by seeing uh, that educating children is a task and gift. This view enable parents to stay in the middle ground of good enough parenting. I would broaden this view to say educating in faith is a mutual task and gift for parents and children. So many times I experienced that Vietnamese immigrant children change from their parents, call them go to back to church, come them back to pray, and come to experience God through the children's eye. When children play an active role in faith formation, both parents and children walk in the path that foster growth in children and a change in parents. Living with children transform parents, even with, within negative situations. If you read my paper ahead of time, I share the story of Ocean Vuong, the well-known Vietnamese poet. Uh, he shared his experience of being physical abuse of his own mother. I don't have time to explain more, but he transformed his mom, his mom behavior, and they both can live a better life as immigrants in this country. How to apply the just love model in family faith formation? Positively speaking, Vietnamese culture helps young people to build an identity and habit of respecting for grandparents and parents to follow their instruction and teaching. Most Vietnamese agree that the essential role of filial piety in Vietnamese culture is to nurture communal cross-generational relationships. Thus, obey, obeying and honoring parents, grandparents, and young children, and also caring for their parents, grandparents at their old age, are both tasks and gifts own children should keep in mind. How about parents? Parents need to be aware that children have the right to be agent. Instead of object or merely passive recipient, again, parents must uh, try to avoid extremes, neither being overpowering nor over permissive. Overpowering parents will diminish children's agency, while permissive parents may inhibit their children from developing a strong and solid mind to make moral choices. Parents also should avoid idealized family norms, just as uh, generational sacrifice. So many Vietnamese parents said, I come here for you. 
but parents also need to know that because of their children for better education, they come and children transform parents' dream, uh, parents' expectation and transform the family. So instead of strict idealized norms, parents will recognize the significant role children play in their faith journey. I want to share with you Trina's three strategic points to enhance children's and young people agency. First, avoid subsuming children's agency by over initiating. Let children do that and we work with them. Second, promote children's agency and flourishing directly. And last, respect them, respecting them as moral persons and helping them to uplift their self-reliance and self-adjustance. This is important. Instead of command children what to do, help them to recognize why and how. And how do we apply this uh, in faith-based communities? Immigrant parents and family cannot achieve this model. So they need help, they need support. Vietnamese immigrant parents should be successful in their children's education and faith formation. How do we trans train them? What kind of formation that we can help them to grow in understanding and developing skills to know the boundaries of assimilation and retention between the two cultures and to keep a balance in their agency with their children. So, uh, follow Daniel Guti of three levels of foundational consideration. You can read more again in my paper uh, to explore pastoral level, spiritual level, and theological level. So with that in mind, um, there are some questions for you to explore. Um, for example, church faith based community are called to design a program of faith formation, which is not for children but with children. Have you experienced in your family? Churches, schools are faith formation with children. And what strategies do you propose to enhance children's voices and let them make the family and community a better place? And this is the re references for the paper. And thank you for listening. And I am open for any feedback or questions. Thanks again. Thank you, Anhua. Excellent job. A wonderful information and scholarship there. Um, I just want to welcome any comments on Anhua's work and presentation. Now, please remember to unmute yourself. And don't worry about raising your hand. Just jump in. This is always an awkward moment when nobody is going to say something. So I just open up the floor just to thank you so much for uh, your uh, very clear presentation. And I must say, I'm really uh, so in line with what you're saying that children are so aware of their own way uh, that um, uh, they have their own voice and their own agency and that, uh, that um, you have to avoid to idealized that family norms. I think we are in a time, uh, at least in most countries in the world, where you can't just rely on what the way we always did it because it's not there anymore. And children are now born and young people with a real awareness of uh, how to deal in the world and that moral compass in them. So I totally agree with you. So it's not really a question how to do it. Although I do see um, that the difficulty is for RE with children that often, you know, as you also, also mentioned, parents are often uh, more or less against it or not aware of it, how they can stimulate their children. And they often um, are a threshold for the children to open up. So young people, which is my uh, uh, research object more, you can uh, 
attract yourself sort of as trainers or youth ministers or teachers but uh, children are always uh, minors who are dealt with through parents or so and I think that's a huge difficulty but I don't know whether you have any idea about that you have of course showed a bit about that family way of looking at them in church but often the parents have more difficulty to really dive into it than children I don't know whether you uh, recognize that but thank you once more that was the main uh, point other comments for Anhua I'll add my uh, uh, just a brief comment I I thought about my experience in in uh, in a uh, local church. And one of the things that we did, were, which actually embodied your notion of moving from doing things for children to doing them with children, I thought that was a really concise way of encapsulating what you were trying to say. But um, in terms of worship planning, we had uh, children uh, draw pictures and write uh, prayers and other forms of the liturgy, and then would use that in Sunday morning worship, which empower the kids. I mean, they felt great to see their stuff up on the screens and being used in worship with adults, but also encourage the adults to see the children as having uh, the ability to do worship leadership. So it, it, it changed not only the adults, but also uh, it really empowered the children. So thank you very much for your paper. I really enjoyed reading that. Thank you. I also really appreciated the paper and your presentation and your emphasis on agency uh, for kids. I work with teenagers and uh, I love that you spent your time in the kindergarten classroom. Do you have any stories that are your favorite about how your kindergartners um, contributed with agency? I find that fascinating. Um, how a kindergartner is uh, is going to start to explore the the some of the moral questions. Yeah, so many uh, stories that I learned. For example, um, we have so many communist parents came to our kindergarten to teach their children, and even though we cannot have any image of uh, the crucifix like you can see in the background or any image of God, however, we we pray. And then, for example, we, we help them to memorize our father. And uh, one day, a parent came to me and said, sister, my kid didn't want to eat unless we pray. And I got shocked. I said, oh, God, I am in trouble now. But then um, the parent recognized my face. But they said, sister, this is a good sign. They want us to pray. They want us to uh, think about God. And now what? We are thinking. So that's your, another way of doing evangelization. We cannot reach directly, but through children. And the children have that uh, power to uh, quit eating if the parent didn't pray to our father within a communist government. Another example, for example, I shared that in my paper. We have children to learn how to uh, give priority for the elderly or women with pregnancy or those need help uh, to have a seat on a bus. Uh, uh, and then one day uh, a dad came to me, said my three years old daughter came and told me that, that daddy, you didn't do something right. And uh, the dad asked why. Uh, she, she, he t she told me, she told the dad that this morning you sat next to the elderly when the elderly didn't have a seat and you didn't give her that priority. And the dad told me that I was embarrassed. My daughter, my three, three years old daughter learned from you how to do that and I didn't know. So that is some examples I could share um, during my 10 years, uh, being with kids, how amazing they transform me, the way they pray, the way they imagine, the way they contemplate. So I hope I can uh, respond to your question that way. Yeah. Absolutely. As a, as a fellow teacher, I know I've been transformed in many ways uh, by my teens as well. Thank you for those stories. Thank you. We have time for one more comment for Anhua.
Okay, wonderful job, Anhua. Thank you so much for your good work. Thank you, everyone, and God continue to bless our conference. Thank you. I'm happy to introduce now Kayla August, who is a student at the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College, where she is pursuing, pursuing a PhD in theology and education with a focus on preaching, particularly preaching from the lay perspective. Kayla will present Preaching from the Kitchen, the Proclamation of Black Women from Seemingly Ordinary Spaces and How It Transforms the Faith of Youth. Hello all, good to be with you today. Um, can you give me a second to get out my slideshow here? Hmm. Let's see. There we go. So lay preaching is a passion of mine, um, particularly preaching that can happen um, outside, inside and outside the liturgical space. So today I'm gonna talk to you about preaching from the kitchen um, and the many spaces that I have heard black women preaching that I think really has an impact. But I'm gonna start by inviting you into an example and then going from there. It happens in a passive revelatory moment. A woman with a hot comb begins speaking of how she met her spouse to an enraptured audience of women who affirm with an uh-huh, a that's right, and an amen. She quotes Corinthians 13, four, as she attests to the love she felt that was both patient and kind. A love that whispers to her heart of a God active in her life through the witness of her husband. The God she knows is not distant, but intimately entwined with her life, her love life, her family, her job, her friends, and more. This God breaks the bounds of her weekly liturgical service and breaks into the salon with the ease of a straightening comb. Between the blow dries and the beauty tips, the word is opened with seamless grace and confidence, confident in the God who is always present with her in every moment and who is there for anyone who wants to listen. These powerful preaching moments in my life have been from the lips of aunts, grandmothers, sisters, hairdressers, and friends. These testimonials cause me to see that perhaps the greatest preaching doesn't happen in the pews. These sermons could be heard outside the church walls, in the kitchens, the living rooms, the sidewalks, and the salons from women in my family and community. These were testimonial witnesses of truth and transformation from women who chose to share with me their individual stories weave with the fabric of biblical understanding. Though they took place in ordinary spaces, they were anything but ordinary. They transformed that space with the pivotal presence of God's divine word. A recent study in the Journal of Youth and Adolescence on faith said that black women are culture bearers. And I think that's true because the culture of faith which was impressed on me as a child and continues to do so. This pulpitless preaching has a history of women's fight for voice and authority. Both inside and outside the black community, black women have had to find ways to have their voices known despite opposition. Black women, often on the discriminatory end of sexist and racist ideologies have found themselves doubly marginalized within society. Teresa Pry Brown describes this history of black women's call to preach partnered with the silencing of their voice and renovating Sorrow's Kitchen. She starts by explaining the origin of the Black church, a church born from the cultural imperative that all should be free. This church began in the hidden spaces, swamps, woods, caves, and other undisclosed places during the time of institutional slavery in America. Slaves needed a space to worship a God who affirmed their personhood, a personhood not recognized on plantations, a personhood that, saw, that God saw them each equally in his eyes, equally almost. These spaces remained an oppressive space for women. Though the documentation of slave narratives spoke of women as priests, prophetess, queen mothers, as well as the griot, a West African storyteller who held the genealogical records of African-Americans in her memory to tell, they were not allowed to preach at the pulpit. As the in invisible institution of the black church became more institutionalized, women were segmented to non-preaching roles, roles like singing in the choir, teaching children in Sunday, Sunday school, cooking dinner, sponsoring programs, providing financial support, cleaning the building, and training sons and daughters in their home. The segregation of tasks gave pulpit access and perceived power to black men to the exclusion of black women. These women, even in many churches today, are restricted to non-preaching roles that deny their baptismal call. But I believe their sermonizing 
has not stopped. It was simply transformed into other spaces where they hold authority. These designated spaces of authority are what Tona Morrison's beloved called the clearing. In the novel, novel Beloved, the seemingly ordinary spaces held this clearing. This clearing was a place with a huge rock and a place where people came to share and bring their authentic selves. This place was where baby Suge, one of the characters, an itinerant preacher and a woman, preached openly by the spirit and for whoever wanted to listen. Though baby Suge would never be allowed to preach at a weekly service because she was a woman, her second class citizenship disintegrated when they reached this sacred space in the clearing. She became a pulpitless proclaimer, ready to share with a self-made authority. Like Jesus' Sermon on the Mound, her preaching was found in an open space outside of the confines of the liturgy. In Beloved, this place brought freedom and authenticity, not just to Shug, but to every single person who gathered. This clearing is what I have seen enacted in Black female-centric spaces across my lifetime. Kitchens, salons, living rooms, and more. In these female-dominated havens, the authority of women is uncontested reality. Communities of the majority or even male-centered communities know that this is a space where women have authority. These carved out space in society are clearings for sacred inbreaking to occur. They are places where black women not only speak, but are listened to. Lisa Thompson says that listening is a cultural act. We learn to listen based on how we have been conditioned to listen in our communities. Though in many liturgical spaces, the voices of women may lack representation, their voices are prevalent in these female dominated havens where the Bible is not just a story, but a story, but a story intimately linked to their own life. In the black tradition, scripture is not, not just a book, but a living document in their midst that allows play and interplay with the scripture to the, the preacher who is anointed to wield the word, tells it to all who can hear. But how do they preach? In preaching as testimony, Anna Carter Florence names the ancient tradition traditional practice of testimony. It has two parts. One is confession of what one believes, and the second piece is narration of what one has seen, all linked to belief in Christ. Florence notes that this powerful testimonial practice is often practiced in marginalized communities who interpret it as preaching. She also names the gift of the unique preaching perspective, stating that because women exist on the margins, they read scripture through a marginalized perspective. This hermeneutics of marginality shows that they interpret the text by bringing their own ways of knowing, testifying to what they have seen and believe in their black lived experience. According to Florence and feminist writer, Rebecca Chop, this preaching can be called a proclamation of Jubilee. This type of proclamation happens whenever and wherever preaching testifies to those who need it. This means that sacred spaces can come at any time and place. All the space needs to offer is a place of encounter where God can be met. In this proclamatory experience, Black women speak from their marginalized reality to another that is also experiencing marginalization, Black youth. For Timon Davis, a preacher and also a youth-centered catechesis director, she says storytelling is a powerful tool of instruction. Davis says, it is the preacher's responsibility to take the intimate knowledge gained through experience and share it in the sermon so that others may come to know God working in and through their living experience. Black women continue their role today as the female griot, as they continue to be storytellers in their clearings. As they did during enslavement, they pass on their word of mouth cultural stories and lessons, an oral culture not just for the record, but to comfort and teach. In this way, the sermon can still be used as a connective and educational gift for young adults with a communal setting as a knowledge, knowledge base of how God is in their life in tangible ways. Storytelling helps us to build relationships. Unlike a sermon from a pulpit spoken to an audience, the sermon style allows a conversation with the listener, a dialectic call and response in the black community. These new ways of sermonizing preserve oral tradition and find optimal moments of instruction where hearts are truly open and people can knit their cultural values within the community and not just cultural values, but the teachings of the church. To preach the biblical heritage is therefore to preach the most basic doctrine, the normative teachings of the Christian church. And it's there that they learn them. 
These stories honor female voices and invite youth to make their voices known. Reginald Blount, he wrote Toward Homemaking, The Power of Voice Information in Black Youth, talks about W.E.B. Du Bois' idea of two-ness or double consciousness, addressing the kind of split reality that youth um, reside in. They must access who they are in the eyes of society and also within the larger African-American community. The dominant society poses one image and their racial perspective poses another. This often divided identity of Black youth between white and Black spaces and within church and society can be a daily strain. The division is something Black women know exponentially because they also have that double marginality, right, in society if in, within their culture for their gender life. Black youth find their inner voice competes with outer voices. The outer voices in this sense are society, family, friends, school, the media, everything around them. Because the voice of society are a key influencer, they need another voice to enter the conversation. Black women in these ordinary spaces provide a conversation partner. It adds to the dialectic that's going on in society and inside of them, and it brings faith into the conversation. These voices shaping young people are found in these kitchen moments and they restore them back to themselves. Adult conversation partners foster help that allows them to bring their divided selves together. And black women help them honor their authentic selves with these moments of jubilee. But how long does this freedom last? I think is a good question. Bout builds on the work of Howard Thurman's Disciplines of the Heart, noting the need for both. Two things, interpersonal community and intrapersonal community. So interpersonal community would be human's connectedness and relationships with one another, and intrapersonal would be the circumstances and environments that allow persons to fully understand their true self-worth and purpose in life. The intrapersonal relationship building can reconcile our pardoned selves and make us whole. It allows us to focus on the inner elements that present, uh, prevent us from believing we are truly free. For Thurman, internal and external freedom are tied, as liberation can only be achieved when those two come together. This freedom is what is preached in moments of sermonic jubilation. Freedom not found in society can be found within an understanding of community that listens and affirms the struggle while, while they are in times of struggle and even points them to hope. The goal, particularly in faith, is that these youth and young adults are connected to a faith-filled and encouraging voice that deafen out the voices of society. Adult voices affirm who they are and link them to a community where they feel free to be themselves. When children are invited into this clearing, it allows them to put down their walls. They can see behind the wall. It's an it's a idea that Walter Brueggemann brings in. The clearing is a space where the authentic selves are welcome and inherently loved by all the women who gather there. Their love guides the preaching and navigates them, not just what they say, but how they say it is guided in love in those moments. Blout notes that black children need conversation partners that can see what is hidden behind the wall of their daily guides. The secret black church experience that happens in the kitchen becomes a space of transformation and safety for young adults. These spaces open up a space of unfettered truth and honest discussion and of conversations of hardships and joy in the Black experience. Those committed to being in the candid conversation invite young adults into a space of nurturing and guidance that brings about a spiritual transformation that happens over time. Each conversation in, in their clearing, created in their life, excuse me, present a preaching opportunity where God's truth can be known. In this way, the Black church's history of being behind the wall is still happening not in swamps or in caves, but in kitchens and salons and other, other places. Black women foster a space where young people can not only hear a sermon, but they find the words to preach their own. The world outside of these walls does not impose on that space of communal freedom. As Black women invite youth into these spaces, again, kitchens, salons, gatherings everywhere, the streets, the sidewalks, they show them that this is a space that they can create wherever they need it most. The preacher presents realities while unlocking future possibilities. The preacher leads the community, noting that what God has done and what God will do and continue to do in their reality. In the clearing, young adults find a God that loves them for who they are and shows them who they could be. Now, I've spoken about the Black community, but I believe these communities can happen anywhere in all marginalized spaces and actually even outside of them. It's about pulpitless proclaimers that can proclaim a word of jubilee anywhere and everywhere it's needed. So all you need to do is find your clearing and preach.
Thank you so much for the excellent presentation, Kayla. Excellent scholarship. I welcome uh, comments and conversation with Kayla. Um, I um, really appreciated your research on how ordinary spaces like the kitchen can be a holistic space and nurturing space uh, to nurture mind, body, and soul. I was reading your paper and uh, I had a question in mind. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how you define Black women. Yeah. Do you have any specific age groups or regional contexts in mind? Yeah. Um, I don't have a specific age group or context in mind because I do think, um, just as Anwa said, um, all ages can teach and all ages that we learn from each other. Um, I think when I'm thinking of my own context, I think it's been aunts and, and hairdressers and those who are, who are a little older than me um, who shared their wisdom with me. But I think the Black community is vast and wide. I mean, even what Black is and looks like is different from community to community often. Um, but I think uh, typically linked by a cultural perspective. So I think what I would say to you is it is multifaceted. And then that multifaceted also brings multifaceted understandings of who God is. Preaching is my favorite topic. So please ask questions. I love talking about it. All right, I've got one for you. Oh. Um, so I have three young Black women who are a part of my group at our university yeah. and seem constantly frustrated, first of all, with their old white man professor who is trying to understand them and <laughs> with just feeling like they are not understood by most of the other students in the group, even though we are predominantly uh, BIPOC university, we our group tends to have a larger portion of white students. Yeah. How do I hear them and how do we expand their voice so that other students can hear them? When I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, I learn a ton, but they seem very hesitant to speak out in front of the entire group? Yeah. That's an interesting question. I don't know these three students. So I, I'm going to speak from, you know, kind of my lived experience because I would have to actually talk to them and hear their individual stories. Um, I think for any young adult, it's about letting them know that their voice has matters and that it, there's something that, that they can share that not everybody can. I think that's the beauty of, I'm talking about preaching, but um, when I think about good preaching, it's, it's two things. Um, it's both personal and universal, just like a good song or a good movie. It has something that is unique to you, um, but also that connects with others. But also every preacher is different and everybody has a different story to tell. So I think letting them know that even in this space where, again, they might feel like they're three of many and their voices, um, uh, they might have something that people don't want them to share or they might be afraid to share that they have something to share that is valuable and important and that we, we would like to hear it. And I think the other thing is to realize that um, in diverse spaces, and I think any person of color might say this as well, but in diverse spaces, there's a, an acclimation um, that is happening as well. I, I was speaking to somebody on the airplane yesterday and he was doing a d and uh, work. And I remember something that he said that I thought was interesting. Um, he was saying, it's like a community of Latinx students that are coming in to a majority white high school. And they, they just keep saying things like, um, man, you know, it's so white here. And, I remember, and he was like, what does that even mean? Um, and I thought what was interesting about that was I was like, I have been in white spaces my, my whole life or I've been a minority in those spaces. And that even um, a white cultural space has its, own, has its own culture, its own way of being and the way they dress, the way people talk, right? And so we enter as a person of color into those spaces, you're also acclimating, you're adjusting a little bit to figure out how do I exist within this space? And how do I bring my whole self into a space that, um, that I am unique to and that doesn't really always know even maybe that I bring something new. They're just thinking, oh, it's the same thing. 
Um, so I think within that, maybe help them ask like, hey, are you adjusting well to this space? Is there something that, you know, that, that maybe you need, um, that may you need from us just even to share your voice. And then two in the second place is to say, your voice is so important. We'd love to hear it. Um, others are sharing and we'd also love to hear what you contribute to the group because you're a part of this. So I think, yeah, honoring that they contribute and then also recognizing that there might be a time of acclimation that they're still adjusting to in, this, in, in a, an environment that is, has its own cultural narrative different from their own. I hope that answered your question. It, it does. And, and I think that the hard part for them is that they've had to educate me on some things that I thought I knew that I didn't really understand. And I think they feel like maybe they've done that now. So I'm hoping this year might be a breakthrough year where they feel comfortable speaking out a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty in that. Um, I hope what I talked about in this presentation, um, hope that all, hope you know Black women preach in ordinary spaces, but that also that you can too. And I think for you, Dr. Tom, honestly, even admitting times when you're learning from them, I think about that work with my young adults, you know, when they say something and I'm like, man, that was, that was dope. Or like, I really learned something that they realize that they can give to me. And all of a sudden they're like, well, I'm going to speak out more because I have something to offer here. Um, and I, and well, I would obviously agree with that with her wonderful presentation. So in those moments when you're learning um, and they're connecting to you, they're realizing that you see them and really care about them. And it's a safe space to share. We have time for one more question for Kayla. Just a, I'll, I'll just make a quick comment that this, the clearing spaces that you name, Kayla, are exactly so important um, for meaning making and identity formation in light of the necessity of um, Black young people to um, to find, to navigate and potentially offer their narratives in white dominant spaces you know those clearing spaces become so important for sustaining so thank you for for offering that any other comments for Kayla yeah, I might I might say that I think that white women used to have more of those public spaces for preaching and we can't in the salon anymore we there's a there's too big a risk that I'm going to say something that offends one of the other people in the house because we're not on the same, the shared experience is no longer there. Mm -hmm. We've, we've, we've become too, um, too insular, too individualized, too not sharing some of a communal space. And so I, I encourage you to keep celebrating that because it sucks when it's gone. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Kayla, thank you so much for your excellent scholarship and your presentation here. We'll have time to converse more with Kayla at the conclusion of our time together today. Thank you, everybody. I, I do want to shift to our final presentation by David Cho and Karam Han. Reverend Dr. Un Yil David Cho is Assistant Professor of Spiritual Care and Counseling at the Boston University School of Theology. He is a practical theologian who researches and teaches in the area of pastoral theology, spiritual care, social scientific study of religion, and global migration. He is currently serving as the co-director of the Center for Practical Theolo Theology at BU. And Karam Han is a PhD candidate in Christian Education and Congregational Studies at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Karam's research focuses on the eco-integrity of Korean immigrant Protestant women. She is currently the RA, REA student representative. David and Karam will present Children of Exile in Motherland, How Pilgrimage Experience Shapes Ethno-Religious Identity Formation of Immigrant Youth and Young Adults.
Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, let me share my screen to begin our presentation. And then you want give me a thumbs up just on your screen if you can see what I'm sharing. Okay, I don't hear anything, so I, I guess it's it's being everyone can see the screen. We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so you notice that the title has changed uh, as we uh, worked on this project together. Uh, we had to rename this, uh, rename our title. So it's now called a Pilgr pilgrimage to the motherland. And the subtitle is How Pilgrimage Experience Shapes Intersectional Identity Formation of Immigrant Youth and Young Adults. Um, so as you know, as you can see, this is an interdisciplinary conversation. I'm a pastoral theologian and Garam is a religious educator. Uh, so this has been a fun way to reflect on our experience together and but also find ways to critically and also generatively reflect on uh, this educational um, and also formation experience together. So for today's agenda, uh, first up, Karam and I are both, we both have cold. <laughs> uh, so you notice that our voices are not pronounced as they could be. So I hope that uh, uh, you can listen, you can still hear as well. Um, so the first part of the presentation would be, uh, I'm going to really describe and introduce this a uh, program called the Trip to the Motherland. And I'm going to, um, uh, in the paper, I analyzed this, mother, this program as a transnational pilgrimage and also a developmental journey for um, Korean American second generation um, youth and young adults. And the second part of this presentation will be uh, given by Karam and Karam will um, reflect and also analyze this pilgrimage as an embodied and experiential learning, especially the importance of uh, this kind of uh, religious education in the Korean American immigrant church setting. And then at the end, we're going to conclude by, uh, so what, what, what we didn't put on the paper. <laughs> so uh, there are some this inklings or thoughts that we're still processing together. Uh, so we are not able to uh, write them on the paper, but these are some, post uh, yeah post work thoughts that we have we want to share with you and maybe uh, we want to invite you to reflect with us so all right then so the trip to the motherland program uh, so so in 1988 uh several korean leaders in pcusa churches launched this pilgrimage program called the trip to the motherland to provide opportunity for second gen or even third gen these days, uh, Korean American youth, young adults, college students to visit South Korea, which is their motherland, to have an in-depth immersion experience to learn and see Korean history and culture, and also the heritage of Korean Christianity, which uh, goes back to the uh, the arrival of American missionaries in Korea in, for, in the 19th century. Uh, so they get these they, are, they receive these chances to visit Korea about for about two weeks every summer. And since 1988, this uh, program has been going quite strong. So it's been almost 30 years. And uh, it's been funded and supported by both the PCUSA, Presbyterian Church USA, for those of you who do not know, and also the Presbyterian Church of Korea, PCK. So this has been a joint partnership between two Presbyterian churches in America and in Korea to run this program. And, um, and this quote uh, you see on the screen, I really saw where I came from. Uh, this has been a kind of the main uh, pattern, main theme of the stories uh, that uh, we, we heard from the participants. And to share the backstory, Karam and I also participated in this, uh, this pilgrimage. I, I, I did it twice, once as a participant, once as a leader, and Karam also joined uh, this program as a leader in 2018. So this is a very much, uh, very intensely personal uh, reflection that we are offering here uh, together. And uh, to describe and to introduce uh, uh, to this pilgrimage program to, uh, to other people, um, I use 
the work of uh, Heather Warfield. Uh, she's a psychologist of religion uh, who uses developmental uh, psychologies to uh, think about pilgrimage as a developmental process or developmental journey. So uh, she argues that for youth and young adults, pilgrimage is a developmental process or journey of self-discovery, personal growth, and identity development. So uh, kind of uh, thinking about this program through the development the perspective, uh, what we are able to see um, is that uh, these young pilgrims who are Korean American, um, second and third generation um, youth and young adults, they receive by visiting their motherland, uh, they receive rare opportunities to, um, I wouldn't say, we wouldn't say develop or achieve particular identity, but to really wrestle with and explore their transnational uh, dimensions of their identity, right? So Korean American identity that has a transnational dimension, as well as their religious heritage, uh, especially in this game, reformed Christianity, that also has a transnational dimension. So the next part, Karam will continue. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Uh, in my portion, I will talk about the need for more embodied and experiential religious education for Korean American youth and young adults by suggesting the trip to the motherland program as an example. So Korean American immigrant churches as the place for the Christian practice and also a social culture center have a unique responsibility to help Korean American young people, not only to learn about their Christian traditions, but also accompany them to embrace their ethnic, racial, and gender identity. So based on Christine J. Hong and Mark Chung Hun's ethnographic research on how Korean American adolescents, girls, and men aged between 25 and 45 receive and experience Christian education in Korean American immigrant churches, Korean American immigrant churches prioritize text-based learning while youth and young people desire more experiential opportunities for building intimate interactions and interpersonal and communal relationships. Youth and young adults have been primarily placed in the position of receiving instruction on how they should believe God and recognize their Korean American Christian identities by obeying the religious and cultural instructions of their parents and elders in the church setting. So in order to address these challenges of youth and young adults in Korean American immigrant church, it is vital to provide a brave space for them to explore and wrestle with their intersectional identity. In particular, church education should offer more opportunities for embodied and experiential learning to aid individuals in their journey of self-discovery. And I see the trip to the motherland program as a pilgrimage can be a valuable opportunity for experiential learning for Korean Americans to think about their racial, ethnic, and religious identities intricately intersect with one another by visiting and occupying the sites of where they came from. And the program offers unique occasions to experience intimate, transnational, embodied, and experiential learning through visiting transnational spaces, sharing personal and communal stories, and creating new memories. Bo Young Lee underscores the significance of dialogical pedagogy, which encourages students to bring their living text, such as wisdom, insights, life experiences, cultural backgrounds, and critical analysis rather than relying solely on written texts that have been inherited by their parents and grandparents. So in the pilgrimage, the Korean American young people bring themselves as a living text to their motherland, interacting and conversing with the written text of Korea that their parents have told them back in the United States, which indicates a process of transformation. And through the program, as the young pilgrims become pilgrims in the motherland, they gain courage and receive affirmation to work on their stories and think critically about their intersectional identities as Korean American Christians. The work of transformation is possible because of a pilgrimage as an experiential and embodied learning allows and empowers these young people to engage and interact with fellow young pilgrims, the cultural, religious, 
and political history of Korea, the local people they meet and the spirit of their ancestors and the spirit, the land of the motherland. Because this, because this pilgrimage is an embodied experience, the participants gain and experience a new sense of connection to their motherland. This kind of embodied transnational connection can be framed as uriness, according to Hong. Christian Hong emphasized the significance of cultivating uriness. Uri is a Korean word meaning we, and which empowers Korean American young people to connect with their transnational Korean heritage across generations through stories, culture, tradition, spirituality, and history. And lastly, the trip to the motherland program offers participants to the opportunity to engage in the colonial learning by shifting their physical bodies away from intentional and unintentional sources of the dominant power in the United States, participants can become more aware of how their intersectional and transnational identity affects them differently in different environments. And this program challenges individuals to recognize the colonial power that exists not only within the United States, but also within their own racial, ethnic, Christian, and gender identity. And Hong also claims that recovering and retelling our stories in conversation with our ancestors' stories are powerful ways to resist the colonial power and claim our genealogy of resilience and faith. American identities. Um, so going forward, uh, we're, we have four lingering questions uh, that we invite you to think uh, with us together. So the first, first limitation or the first question is the question around the post-pilgrimage education and care. So uh, developmental perspectives is helpful because it helps us to reflect on the process of pilgrimage, but also pre-pilgrimage and post-pilgrimage process. So uh, one of the things that this program fails to do is to provide education and care for participants after the pilgrimage, after they return to the States, right? Because uh, not everybody, but these young people, as they, a lot of them visit their motherland for the first time, uh, get to visit the sites they only saw on TV or Netflix, they get to see them and they gain this new insight and new ideas of who, who they are and where their parents come from. So they go through this uh, often internal transformation. But when they come back to the US, whether that's Chicago, Nashville, Boston, uh, they, they know that their setting, uh, their home environment have not changed, right? So they might go through this time of confusion and struggles, especially in post pilgrimage phase, but um, reflecting on this together, the, this pilgrimage program doesn't offer that kind of post-pilgrimage post care and education. And also I have observed that the program's leadership appears to consist mainly of males. And given the organization's affiliation with a male ministry group, the program is led by male elders or deacons. So consequently, participants exclusively engage with male leaders during the program. And also the program could benefit from paying more attention to interreligious aspect. While Christianity is major focus, it is important to recognize and respect our other religions in Korea, like Korean shamanism, Neo-Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And it, it would be helpful for young people to learn about Korean Christianity in relation to other religions and philosophies by incorporating more opportunities for converse, conversations and visits that explore interreligious aspects, participants can gain a deeper understanding and appreciation for the diverse religious landscape of Korea that their grandparents and parents inherited. Yeah, last but not least, the question of accessibility and equity. Who gets to go to pilgrimage, right? So as you have read from the paper, uh, you have to pay for your own airfare to go to Korea. The rest of the trip gets covered by uh, the two denominations, but still you have to pay for these days, $2,000 over a trip 
to take it to Korea to attend this program. And we also thought about like, why do some people in PCUSA know about this program? Why some people do not, right? So uh, who gets to hear about this opportunity? And who gets to go? And we, we're also aware that um, uh, a, lot, a large number of uh, youth and young adults in Korean immigrant churches are undocumented, which that means uh, they may not be able to uh, travel internationally because of their uh, documentation status. So um, the question of who gets to be a part of this um, and uh, for students or young people who are not able to take this opportunity, then what can be some other ways to provide more, uh, more embodied and experiential learning opportunities for uh, the young people in our uh, Korean immigrant churches. So these are some four questions that we came up with and we would love to hear your feedback. And thank you everyone for your attention. Wonderful job, David and Karam. Excellent job, thank you so much. Uh, I welcome a few minutes of conversation with David and Karam. Yes, if I may, um, thank you so much for your presentation and your beautiful paper. And um, I uh, keep having the same uh, impression that there's a lot alike with the uh, Catholic World Youth Days, which have the same uh, impression that everybody comes there and then considers themselves, well, I belong to a large group and this is my identity and here I can totally be who I am and it's a really a high level um, event and experience for young people. And the same thing, uh, as you mentioned, uh, apart from it's been led by men, but that's the obvious in the Catholic Church, a huge issue nowadays. Uh, also, um, that when they return, it's very hard how to get back and be that same person again. They feel even more alone than when they went. And what we see, what really helps a bit is on the one hand to uh, let them be also an agent themselves there. So they can do that, I'm sorry, um, they can do that by um, digital connections. It's They are very much better in those uh, sort of uh, connection things than we as uh, uh, teachers or trainers are. So let them have uh, digital communities to, to be kept. Uh, when you have met each other, it's easy to, do, to stay connected to, through that. And what we also did was people who were not able to afford a trip, especially to Panama from Europe last time, that we had an at-home version as well. So we had uh, a parallel program. So if you have that trip planned in summer, there, there's also a summer at-home program and you get that connection with people also staying at home in their own country and to then get more bridging there. So some suggestions on your answers, but we could talk about that the entire evening uh, or day or when we are chat. But thank you for that. And I would like to, uh, wanted to share this. Uh, I hope it helps a bit. Thank you. I see a raised hand from Sola Ayo Obi Remy. Sola, are you there? There you are. Thank you so much. Um, it's It's been quite interesting listening and learning from this experience of the um, the pilgrimage to the motherland. So uh, I have some questions. I'm sorry, I hadn't read your paper. I, I guess I, I missed the link to that. But I'm just wondering, the curriculum, is there a curriculum that helps them to come up with these identities, this self-identity, understanding where they're from and all that? Is it ex explicit or is it an implicit thing where it's uh, assumed they will pick this up? I'm just wondering, do some of the young people not just see it as an adventure? Like, oh yeah, I get to go to Korea for a week or two weeks and then I'm back to base. Is there anything that helps them to know this is the intent? of this trip? Is it made explicit to them? And is there something in the curriculum during the trip that says, okay, now think through this, relate this to what you do in the United States, relate it to your life in um, Korea, relate it to what your ancestors are like? Is there some kind of follow through 
to achieve the goals of this trip? Just right. curious to know. Thank you. But thank thank you for your question. And uh, so when this the, so the program was actually designed in 1980s to really address that issue around identity, right? So I would say at least for the first gen leaders, Presbyterian Church leaders, uh, the goal, uh, their ideal, their aspiring goal was to help uh, their children uh, to have a more expensive or nuanced understandings of their identity by going to their motherland, right? Uh, because they hear a lot about Korea or Korean identity or where their parents come from, but um, but pilgrimage really offers an opportunity for them to see and visit and smell and interact with uh, people from Korea and et cetera. So I would say that curriculum, uh, it's 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 been a part of that mission of this program. Uh, but you're right. Um, but how it gets executed, I think it depends. Who's the leader? Uh, so when I, uh, so there are, so, right. So one, I think not every pilgrims uh, come with the expectations of, oh, I want to think about my identity or, uh, well, some of them just want to go to Korea and have fun, right? So there is that different, very diverse intentions uh, are there, but I think uh, even though uh, it's not curriculum wise explicitly stated, uh, but the places that are chosen to visit are often designed to really uh, help people to raise questions about their faith and and also their identity. Uh, because of the sites like DMZ or uh, the cultural sites um, and things like that. So I would say, it's implicitly there, but it's also explicitly sometimes can be done by the leaders who, because there is all, does every, after every day, there is a gathering uh, where leader gets to have a conversation with the, with the youth and young adults. So, but you know, in the, in the course of pilgrims, things happen, schedule changes. So honest, sometimes that's not always organized in terms of that, like a teaching moments or educational moments. But um, yeah, but so I, I think it's implicitly uh, structured as well as explicitly structured, but sometimes it doesn't really work. Uh, so I, I think Karam might have a different uh, idea. Yeah, and also thank I want to add that. Yeah, thank you. And also I want to add that uh, the curriculum itself is very flexible and especially like the difference with the first gen who participate in a, like maybe first 10 years, they had like less information than like th these like youth and young adults who uh, get to know about Korea through social media or Netflix. So they have more information. So they brought their idea when we participate the pilgrimage program and they suggest, oh, I want to go this place. Then uh, what I have experienced at least was uh, very flexible to open to uh, change the curriculum depends on the uh, the dates and there's uh, the students suggestion. So I I will say that uh, we, we had uh, very like mutually communicate through the curriculum, but also at the same time, because of the culture, the Korean culture, we respect the elders and um, the leaders. So uh, definitely like, I will say 80, 9% is uh, depends on the leadership, but also uh, the rest of the percentage we open for the participants to uh, choose the place they want to go. Thank you. Thank you. We have time now for a collective conversation. Uh, any comments, uh, continued comments that you'd like to make about any individual presentations or the intersections you're finding between presentations, and I'll just begin by um, noting uh, Mayan Lee Tron's um, comments in the um, in the chat. Um, so you might take a look at that along with um, the conversation you're hearing and participating in. So I welcome I welcome your comments and conversation. I have a question um, and comment for both Kayla and also David and Karam, thank you to the three of you for your excellent presentation. Um, there seems to be a tension between cultivating this set apart space for youth and children, um, and also working to dismantle those systems that forcibly set 
those youth and children apart and exclude them. So how have you observed that your communities think about both flourishing in set apart spaces like the clearing or through pilgrimages, and also think about pushing back on those constructs and exclusions that make those clearings and pilgrimages necessary as a part of life? I guess um, I'll, I'll go first only because I think it's brewing. Maybe it'll give you a little time to, to brew a little more to everybody. Um, thank you so much, uh, Christine. Also, loved your book. We read it in class. Awesome. <laughs> so um, really cool. Um, for me, I think those two things are, are intrinsically intertwined um, because you have to live in spaces and you also have to renew yourself for the spaces that you continue to live in. Sometimes just stepping into a space could... Um, as the first or the only feels like, you know, you're setting new ground, but by just making it from day to day, but at the same time, you need to renew yourself in the spaces outside to be able to set new ground, um, because the things that you are encountering, the questions that you're receiving, or even the, the hardships that you are experiencing, maybe no one understands in the way that you do, or maybe they just never have to experience in a particular way. And so I think um, the clearings in life are spaces of renewal. I think we have to remind ourselves that we can't just live in the clearings um, because then we never come back to the spaces where we're pushing up, that where we're widening the clearing to being everywhere instead of just in this all tucked in space. Um, and in, for me, that has been the people in my life that, um, that understand that the spaces that I'm walking into that might even seem like something simple um, could be really hard or that the, the weeks and months in these spaces um, can sometimes seem like, like years <laughs> or decades. Um, and then, and they help me in the clearing to go back and do it again. Thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, thank you, Christine. And uh, cause her work is a big part of our, uh, our investigation. And uh, so, yeah, I think, so while we, uh, we, come to value this, uh, this pilgrimage as a new way of religious education, even identity formation and transformation. But we also notice the challenges, especially around accessibility for me, like who gets to go to Korea? Like not everyone can afford to go there, you know, like um, so, and why do some people know about re really well? Why don't seem like, and uh, so there are a lot of challenges around that. So I think for me, so I see the importance of like as a participant and also as a leader. And I think, uh, I think it takes a lot of courage uh, for me to share honest feedback uh, to the people who have power to organize this program and in a really honest and also generative way for them that uh, while this program is so valuable, but it also excludes uh, some people. Uh, not everyone can uh, enjoy this opportunity. Then, uh, and what are some other possible alternative ways that we can provide this kind of learning to people who may not be able to um, easily access this? So maybe we need to think of domestic pilgrimage uh, to um, LA, K-Town, or uh, there are other ways that, uh, what are some other ways that we can help uh, Korean American second gen, third gen to think, uh, think about their Korean uh, identity? Uh, in a different in a different way. Uh, so I think having that hard questions and raising those questions to the elders uh, who might not welcome those ideas. And I think that's been kind of my personal um, challenge and struggle uh, for me to proceed. So yeah, thank you. And uh, for me personally, um, I think this uh, process of preparing this paper was helpful for me to uh, think critically about the program again. So I really appreciate Dr. Joe invite me to write about this paper because as I already mentioned, this program is mainly led by male uh, leadership. And I was the one, like only one uh, female uh, in the group, except two other, uh, two participant students. Um, so. After the program, I was just, um, there is, uh, I didn't want it to process and there is a lot of things which already I have known because I grew up in Korea, but, uh, and then I don't want to think about it, but it's because of Dr. Joe's invitation, I was able to see critically, not only with my um, like 
uh, emotional re response to this program. So I appreciate that, and I I, I think this is this is needed for not only for me but also for the students who participate that they they get to chance to write about write the feedback so uh at the end of the tree we were uh we had time to read each other's feedback together and we see there is a similarities and also like differences and like sharing the different perspective was helpful and also i was able to share my honest feeling with the student group and that was helpful. And and as as uh, Monique uh, mentioned earlier, I think post pilgrimage process is important for uh, the groups to critically engage for the better uh, program in the future. Thank you. I think Beth Nolan has a comment or question. Um, hi everyone. I'm. Uh, coming from Australia um, and I have a couple of questions uh, one is I'm wondering whether there is a reverse uh, process for the the PCK folk to come to the US uh, and and so it's a reciprocal possibility of learning and then secondly in relation to the uh, the effect of it and the support and the care uh, and the integration, I would want to call it, uh, when they come home. I think that's really important. Um, and I'm wondering whether the youth get to speak to the leadership of PCUSA uh, to question or challenge. How, how do we enable them as a result of their learning experiences to share that with the wider church? Um, I come from this, uh, from an experience of uh, taking a congregation, uh, a few members of the congregation, to an Aboriginal community uh, in uh, Northern Australia, uh, and then similarly having a, a reciprocal group coming uh, to us for a while, uh, so that we really learn from one another and hear about the differences. Um, and I would, uh, I want, I want to. Uh, uh, encourage and affirm uh, just the value of travel to another place uh, to begin to both question your own identity and to experience a wider identity and I do think that that is so educational. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are on. Yeah, PCK has been doing reciprocal work <laughs> several day, yeah, years after they began that. So the Korean young adult group comes to the States during the winter time because that's their winter break is longer than summer break. Um, so it's been reciprocal, but there have been a lot of issues because U.S. North America is a lot more challenging physically for a group to navigate. Uh, whereas the Korea relatively uh, smaller peninsula where uh, normally each group visits 15 cities, 15 cities <laughs> in two weeks. Um, we call that like Korean style, but very fast. Uh, whereas um, for Korean PCK group to visit North America, cost-wise, especially airfare, uh, it's ex extremely expensive. So, uh, so it, so it's been reciprocal um, and uh, finding ways. It's really important for both churches to um, maintain that partnership, right? Um, uh, but at times, not one, not many people know about it. And I think uh, for us to not include that portion in this paper says something, maybe. I think we'll think about that. Uh, but you're right. But there, yeah. Uh, so while pilgrimage is such an, uh, life changing. It could be a life changing experience for, especially young people who are struck, who are thinking about their identities and who they are becoming. But at the same time, uh, this is costly. It's a costly experience that not everyone can afford. Um, so that's that's the uh, one of the emerging questions that uh, is usually it's the leaders who have a conversation with the participants and we get to report them. But honestly. Uh, we are not sure if th th those reports will be read. Uh, so maybe we need to think of maybe this, if we publish this or uh, we've written this on denominational journals to help people know more about it. 
So there are a lot of works that can be done, but one, well, this has been a really historical work that these two transnational churches been doing. And while there are a lot of challenges, but we want to also celebrate what's been done so far. Yeah. I think we've got one time for one more um, comment, question, conversation starter before we close. I'll make a further comment, and that is uh, those of us who are international students who come to the US um, also bring uh, an interesting um, perspective and a widening perspective. And so uh, one of the, the ways in which uh, you can um, develop this process uh, is, is to enable uh, those kinds of um, people who've done the study uh, in the other place to to come and, and talk. So it's, um, you know, it's it's a, uh, the reciprocal nature of and the giving voice to the marginalised or um, I think is really important. And so letting the students talk about their experience uh, rather than just the leaders talk would be important in my understanding. And I love the digital uh, idea that Monique uh, raised because, yes, that's much easier uh, to continue with. Thanks. I wonder if our presenters uh, have any closing remarks you would like to make before we end today. You're certainly not required to, but is there anything you would like to say as we close? Well, I, uh, oh, Sola, I think your hand is raised. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. Something just crossed my mind, and that's about the post, post pilgrimage, that perhaps there could be a plan for like um, maybe a year after. Maybe I know the presenters raised that, that there's no follow-up plan, but maybe like a six month after, a year after to say, okay, now you're back after this pilgrimage. What have you done with what you learned? Maybe it could be part of the curriculum for them to have some goals they set as a, a follow-up. And then there could be a meeting of some sort, six months or a year down the line to say, okay, the goals you set in terms of your identity, your religious um, and uh, other areas of life. What have you done about it? And um, going forward, what will you do about it? How will you encourage someone else? Though part of my heart goes out to those who cannot pay for it though. I've been thinking about that for a while, like those who do not have the finances to pay their airfare. Uh, is there something the church could do about them too and encourage them? And how could this go around other denominations, other other multinational groups in the United States? Thank you. Those are some of my well thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think there's some um, uh, lessons to be learned for young people who cannot travel abroad or to different circumstances, um, especially lessons to be learned from uh, Anhua's presentation and Kayla's presentation um, about young people who are living uh, along uh, along with the young people that uh, David and Karam are talking about, young people who are living with this in-betweenness every day, right? Um, perhaps there are lessons from the work of Anhua and Kayla to um, infuse life into a conversation about uh, what it means to do this meaning-making work with young people who don't have the benefit of travel. Uh, Kayla, I saw your hand real quickly. Yeah, it, it was just um, following up to Christine's question. I've been sitting with it. Can I, can I respond? Please. Absolutely. So 
you, you mentioned about pushing back, like how do we also push back? Um, and I think instead of pushing back, my mind is always how do we push forward? And I think when I was uh, speaking about the spaces outside the clearing, I was thinking about when I think of the history, particularly even in this country, that like 60 years ago, there are spaces that I couldn't even stand in. That to be in that space is already a, a pushback. And then how do I push it forward? It's by making sure that I continue to stand there by asking questions in the moment where that wouldn't be asked, um, probably making comments that wouldn't be asked if I wasn't there. And also by witnessing to what it looks like to be there. Because I know in my life, um, I have a, a shirt that says becoming the person I once needed. I wear it whenever I go somewhere and really need an extra push of like, Kayla, you got this. Um, and part of it is because I realized that there are spaces that I am in now that I never saw anyone before. And if I could have just seen that, I would have known that, that space was open to me and in the church and in the world. And so how can we walk into those spaces and push forward by being there and by showing that not only are we meant to be there, but look what happens when we come. It's a brighter, wider, more inclusive and more dynamic space when we enter in. Wonderful. Friends, thank you so much for being here today uh, to witness this good work. Anhua, Kayla, David, Garam, thank you for your good work and your continued ministry. And we look forward to seeing you at um, more sessions uh, here at our annual meeting. So if you would take time to complete the evaluation for this session, we would sure appreciate it. And we will see you very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes.